When we think monorail, we usually associate them as modern new sleek trains whose single track towers above us in tech-heavy cities or as modern conveniences from getting us from A to B in large theme parks. But the idea of a monorail has been thought of right back in the early stages of steam. Now you might be thinking, how on earth can a steam engine run on a monorail? Luckily in Ireland, they have the perfect answer. Henry Robinson Palmer was a visionist. He was a mechanical engineer and skilled draftsman. He was employed by famous canal and road builder Thomas Telford to do the work on his behalf, eventually becoming Telford's chief assistant, giving him power and benefits. Palmer had an eye for innovation and in 1821 he applied for a patent for a new type of railway system. He conceived a new track held high by 10 foot pillars. The carriage would be suspended underneath via ropes and wheels with a horse pulling the carriage up and down. The idea was quickly shot down as being impractical but the idea of a single track line didn't seem to go away. In the 1870s and 80s, another engineer took up the idea of the monorail and took it to new heights. French engineers Charles Lachigue wanted to build a railway across some of the harshest terrain imaginable, the sand deserts. Building a railway across a desert was not as easy as some may think. Sand dunes are known to shift in the wind and rails could be buried in tons of sand within days of laying them. For thousands of years, the only way to transport goods in a desert is by camel or by camel trains. Camels are the only animal that is capable of carrying heavy goods over long distances without food or water and their hooves spread out as they walk, spreading the weight of the camel and its load so it doesn't sink in the sand. Latique wanted to change all that and bring the marvel of the railways to every corner of the globe. He knew that conventional tracks and engines were out, so inspired by the way camels were loaded, he experimented with monorails. Unlike Palmer's vision of suspending the railway, Lockheed knew that building pillars was not going to be practical and cost effective. So he designed an A-type trestle to hold the rail above with the engine and the cargo would sit upon. The trestle would solve some of the problems the sand would cause, namely burying the rail in a sandstorm, and production was fairly inexpensive. He also knew the engine and the rolling stock would have to be uniquely designed as well. Latigue approached the Hunslet Works Company in Leeds to create his unique engines, and it fell to designer Antole Manet to make Latigue's vision a reality. The design allowed the engine to straddle the rail rather than sit on it. This meant that the engine had to be perfectly balanced for it to work properly, so it had two of everything two boilers, two fireboxes, two smoke boxes, and two chimneys. In order to keep the water at an equal level in each, boiler pipes were added to allow water and steam to flow between the twin boilers. Each engine had three double flanged wheels and were driven by twin cylinders situated at the front. The wheels were set at 90 degrees and standard coupling rods provided the power exchanges as you would find on standard locomotives. This also meant that the wheels were practically hidden. The tender itself also had an auxiliary engine. It was engaged by a friction clutch which was operated in the cab via a hand wheel. The geared auxiliary engine powered the tender wheels and was engaged when the train was going to take heavy loads or going up gradients. Because of the extra engine, technically this is the only example of a 030 plus 020 engine anywhere in the world. Like with camel loads on the camel trains, balance was everything. If you put something on one side of the trestle, something else had to go on the other side with the exact weight to counteract it. That meant if the train was taking cattle and loaded one cow, then another cow of a similar size would have to travel on the other side. This also went for people. It was up to the guard and station master to ensure the balance was correct for the train to move. But they were powerful 
and it was claimed that the engines have a pulling weight of around 240 tonnes at 30 miles an hour. In 1886, Latigue wanted to show his engine to the world, so he brought an engine and a stretch of line to an exhibition in London. It had a mixed reception, but it was decided to try the idea out. In Ireland, the locals of North Kerry wanted a railway between Listowel and Ballybunion. It was decided that this would be the perfect place to trial the monorail. Building was as swift as Latigue expected, and just two years and £30,000 later, the railway was opened. The railway was just as versatile as any other. It took freight, cattle, goods, sand and passengers. The highlight of many people's journey though was the shunting. Instead of standard points, the railway would have to use turntables to move the engine and rolling stock from one track to another, and if it passed over roads, then the whole trestle would have to open like a gate to let the traffic through. The 11 passenger carriages were double-deckered, with the first class and expensive fare sat in the compartments, while the cheap seats had more of an open view. The railway was brilliant for the tourist industry, passing by the golf course and the beach, and the school kids would watch cheekily as the engines would slip as they coated the top rail with soap, much to the annoyance of the drivers. While from the outside the railway appeared to be thriving, in the accounting room the railway was barely keeping its head above water. In all the years it was operating, the railway barely made a profit. The Civil War of 1921 caused the railway to be severely damaged and faced with its lack of funds, it was decided to close the railway for good. The railway was gone, but not forgotten. In 1988, a hundred years after the railway opened, the centenary fanned the flames to recreate the railway. By then, apart from 50 metres of tracks and a lonely carriage saved by enthusiast Michael Barry, the rest of the railway, including the engines, were long gone. Thanks to researchers Michael Gurin and Michael Foster, whose books on the railway contained invaluable information, from their work a committee was formed and the new railway was formed. The railway now contains 1,000 metres of tracks with three platforms and two turntables and three sidings. The rolling stock, now without the top side view, have been built as exact replicas of the originals using photos and memories and the single engine is an exact replica in style and design. The only difference is that the engine is now a diesel engine rather than steam and it now sports a rather large headlamp. The new railway sits just 100 metres from its original terminus. When the railway was closed, the Listal terminal and the areas surrounding it including the foundations of the demolished engine house and switch bases were turned into a park and a goods shed nearby, not related to the railway but very handy, was restored and converted into a museum where people shared their memories of the monorail. Monorails have moved on quite considerably since Latrigue's time but I know that great dreams have to start somewhere. Who knew it went back as far as the 1800s? The Latrigue monorail is still running in as an Easter special from the 8th to the 10th of April and then open every day from May the 1st to October. If you're visiting Ireland and make it a part of your visit, it's a one-of-a-kind railway and it's amazing to experience it again. <laughs>